welcome to Northwest Newsweek. For the first time in over a decade, the highway between Thunder Bay and Nipigon has an active truck inspection station. Ontario Transportation Minister Pradmeet Sarkaria was in Shunya on Friday to announce the opening of the facility. Vasilios Bellos reports. It's a new state-of-the-art facility the province says will improve road safety on northern Ontario highways. On Friday, the province announced the opening of a new $30 million truck inspection station in Shunya. It happened during a visit from Ontario's Transportation Minister, Pravmeet Sarkaria. Trucks that roll through the station can be inspected for important safety aspects, including underinflated tires or malfunctioning brakes. Ensure that uh, the trucks that are being uh, that are on our roads um, remain safe, and those that are not uh, get taken off. So, we have um, leading technology on stations like this that help us assess the safety of trucks. While the long-awaited station is a step towards safety, highway advocates have been calling for stronger training regulations for truckers. Sarkaria says he recognizes this and understands the unique challenges of driving northern roads. From a weather-specific uh, nature, train people on our roads, especially commercial vehicle drivers. Um, we're looking and talking with safety advocates, um, the Ontario Trucking Association, and many others who also themselves have been uh, advocating uh, on uh, truck safety and road safety. Having a station like this isn't necessarily going to enforce people to drive safely. Shunya Mayor Wendy Landry says the station will make vehicles safer, but stresses the importance of advocacy and enforcement. We have to keep that peace going and keep reminding people to drive safe on our highways. But this station offers a, a, another step to double checking on the transportation, the commercial transportation in the area. Vasilios Bellos, TBT News. There were some emotional speeches in the Greenstone Council Chambers this week regarding the Franco-Ontario flag. Officials from AFNU, the Francophone Association of Northwestern Ontario, made deputations to Council after a decision was made last month to fly the green and white flag just one week per year rather than year-round. We were shocked and in disbelief. We were no longer able to see our flag as a symbol of inclusion and our existence in the community. The Franco-Ontarian flag was created in 1975 and holds deep significance to the French-speaking community in Greenstone. Around 70 representatives and supporters of AFNU packed the council chambers on Monday to have their voices heard. Up until now, the Franco-Ontario flag was flown all but two weeks of the year when the Every Child Matters flag and the Métis Nation flag took its place on the municipal flagpole. Greenstone Mayor James McPherson says the decision to now fly the Franco-Ontario flag just one week every September was all about being equitable with their flag policy. The Francophone community is a strong community. It's a recognized community in the area. And they have had their flag flown. We have had comments from the Indigenous communities as to why their flags weren't flown. And so as we reviewed the flag policy, this gave us the opportunity to step back and look at what could be more equitable for all, all communities in our area. Although the policy change has already been approved, there will still be further discussions on the issue, including at another Greenstone Council meeting on April 8th. A formal partnership has been signed for a project aimed at creating sustainable energy solutions in this region. Officials with Lake Nipigon Forest Management and Char Technologies hosted an open house in Herkut on Wednesday regarding what they call the next generation of renewable natural gas. Riley McManus reports. The partnership is between Char Technologies and Four First Nations. AZA, BNA, BZA, and Red Rock Indian Band. They're all cooperating on an ambitious venture called Lake Nipigon Forest Sustainable Energy Solutions. The idea is to convert unused wood fiber into two types of renewable energy sources for our region. The project has been in the works for the last couple of years and was originally supposed to be built in Nipigon. An open house was held in that community in 2023, but the location was later changed to this spot in Herkut after an environmental assessment gave the property off Lofty Davis Road a clean bill of health. It was always been waiting for the First Nations to get opportunities like this, and now it's happening. I, I think about, I think about my my children, my grandchildren, uh, the opportunities that they're going to have coming. You know, it, it's fantastic. It's just, uh, it, it's about time that this. Hardy goes on to acknowledge the importance of creating sustainable energy 
and the significance this partnership will have for generations to come. Andrew White is the CEO of Char Technologies, which has a technology called high temperature paralysis. He explains what the process entails once the biomass is collected from the forest. So as we heat it up, we basically crack the wood into two products. One is a bio coal, so that gets used for metallurgical coal replacement, so decarbonizing heavy industry. The other is a gas that we can upgrade to renewable natural gas. So it's completely interchangeable with natural gas, but it's made from renewable sources. White goes on to explain what these types of renewable energy would be used for, which extends from home heating to bigger structures, which would be hard to electrify in the future, but would be easy to decarbonize. Jordan Hutton is part of the cooperative with Lake Nipigon Forest Management. He details how so much biomass left over from the trees is usually discarded by being burnt and how that has a negative impact on our environment. Um, so now we found a home for that material right now that uh, is currently left out there and uh, uh, on site. So I, I think I think it hits it ticks a lot of boxes as far as community empowerment, uh, environmental sustainability and uh, and providing clean, renewable natural gas to uh, to the system. Officials here say the new facility in Herkut will come with a price tag of $50 million and will be in operation by 2025. Riley McManus, TBT News. The Nuclear Waste Management Organization has released new research into the safety of burying nuclear waste at their two potential sites, including the one near Ignace. Lead author Paul Grzeszewski says the findings solidify their confidence about the safety of the two sites. The additional information that's really got more precision on in the past year is on the detailed chemistry, the hydrogeology, the structure of the geology at depth. And all of these things are basically saying that uh, these are good locations for long-term stability for hosting a fuel. So it's the combination of all of these uh, technical aspects that builds into the story. The 2023 Confidence and Safety Reports provide a summary of the NWMO's understanding of each potential site, including the geology, seismic activity, the future glacial cycle, as well as the possibility of future human intrusion. Local anti-nuke groups have expressed concerns about an underground repository in Ignace and the potential danger if radioactive material leaked into the environment and waterways. When asked about those concerns, Grzeszewski says they're confident in their competency plan to safely contain the nuclear waste. We're doing, as other countries around the world, is this multiple barrier approach. So we're not just relying on one barrier, but all these, all these multiple barriers. And then the additional part is the site. So the whole site and these multiple barriers has to work together. And what we've learned by focusing on these two sites and the studies that we've done over the past several years is that these are good sites. That the combination of them provides that, uh, that robustness, that durability that we'll be looking for for safety. The safety reports can be found on the NWMO's website. The town of Ignace has now reconstituted its willingness committee. The previous committee was suspended early January, less than a year before the municipality is expected to decide whether they are willing to play host to a nuclear waste site nearby. The new willingness committee is charged with providing guidance to Ignace Council on the community's willingness to host the deep geological repository for spent nuclear fuel proposed by Canada's Nuclear Waste Management Organization. With 13 members compared to the original four, Mayor Kim Bagri says their, their new committee with, will have more capacity to engage with the public. This ad hoc committee will work uh, with Council and they will work with the community members to make sure that they're informed. Um, any decisions, any information that they want, they'll send them in the right directions. They will work with uh, the consultants that we hired. And then they'll, they'll just, they'll bring their decisions, any recommendations to council. Meanwhile, a delegation from Ignace has just returned from a tour of a uranium mine in northern Saskatchewan. The NWMOs arranged the tour to help the Ignace representatives learn about the safety standards associated with the radioactive material and the communities that surround the mine. Meanwhile, the chiefs of five First Nations are saying no to nuclear waste in north northwestern Ontario. The chiefs are telling the NWMO they will not accept any risk to their water, land and people. It comes just as the agency released a new study which says the Ignace site on the Canadian Shield is a safe place for an underground repository, but KI Chief Donnie Morris doesn't agree. I'll have to disagree with that. 
because uh, you look at what is there right now. There's, uh, I, uh, the sh I guess it's called the sh Canadian Shield, eh? but to open it up uh, to go, what is it, a thousand feet underground? Like there, there's going to be cracks made when you're drilling or blowing up or whatever. I, I'm not a scientist and all that, but I know when you touch something to make changes, it's going to break sometimes in the future. The leaders of KI, Nestantiga, Grassy Narrows, Onigaming, and Wapakika recently formed the First Nations Land Defense Alliance. The five communities are opposed to forestry and mining in their traditional territories, but now they've sent a joint letter to the NWMO regarding the proposed nuclear waste repository. Morris admits he originally wasn't concerned about it because the Igne site is nearly 500 kilometers from his community, but he changed his mind when he thought about all the rivers that flow north into Hudson Bay. I, I don't think I would like to see anything in the future to damage our environment, our homelands in the future. So that's why I decided to come on board. I mean, that's the intent of having an alliance is to make sure uh, we have a say or how we're going to approach this uh, nuclear waste that's going to be put in our, our uh, area of Northwestern Ontario. The NWMO continues to work with Ignace and Wabagoon Lake Ojibwe Nation on their status as potential host communities. But Morris says every community in the region should have a say in whether the project goes ahead. It's time now for a short break. When we come back, a story about not one, but two new hotels plan to be built in Dryden. Relief could be coming soon for visitors of the city of Dryden with the announcement of a new hotel project. It's expected to break ground this summer and be built by the summer of 2025. Nearby Wabagoon Lake Ojibwe Nation is backing the project, which is the second new hotel planned in Dryden. Lee Noonan has more. A new 70-suite hotel is in the works for the city of Dryden. Wabagoon Lake Ojibwe Nation is backing the project. They've engaged Winnipeg-based Rideout Bay Developments to build the hotel. Rideout Bay CEO Ben Cohen says the hotel is designed for longer-term stays. Whether it's for um, consultants, medical locums, uh, nurses, construction workers, uh, healthcare stays, so many different reasons in the north, um, we decided to, to bring the Studio 6 extended stay product. Construction is slated to begin this summer and expected to take one year. With Rideout Bay keeping the construction in-house, they're very confident in sticking to that timeline. 
I'm building currently a hotel in Horn Payne that's about 50 to 60 percent complete and will be complete this summer. And then we'll be moving the early crews uh, construction, uh, uh, concrete and underground to Fort Francis and from there to Dryden. Meanwhile, the Dryden Hotel Group has applied for a site plan extension for their project first announced last year. Due to labor force issues, they're now projecting the 76-room Microtel by Wyndham Hotel will also break ground this summer, a year behind schedule. Both projects are highly anticipated by Mayor Jack Harrison, who says the city has a serious shortage of hotel accommodation. I think it'll be very important for our community. We, we have uh, quite a gap in, uh, in hotels. There's oftentimes that no space available, so I think this will be a great fit for our city. The city is also facing a lack of housing. Harrison hopes that a new seniors complex and 48-unit apartment building will help alleviate that. That's really helping our seniors find uh, affordable living as well as downsize and, and also frees up homes for new families and grow. So a uh, very important development in our city as well. The 24-unit seniors complex is expected to be complete this summer while Harrison hopes to see the new apartment building go up in 2025. Lee Noonan, TBT News. Northern Development Minister Greg Rickford made a number of funding announcements in his riding this week. Rickford oversees the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund, which doled out more than $2 million to a variety of projects. The Township of Alberton is getting half a million dollars to expand their skating season by adding a roof to the community's outdoor rink. Next door in Fort Francis, the historic Sunny Cove Camp is getting nearly half a million dollars. The project includes demolishing unsafe buildings and renovating Russell Hall for future generations to enjoy. Rickford says the Heritage Fund is meant for projects like this. It's to go and find these gems, um, come to understand that under new ownership, in this case the city or the town of Fort Francis, how we can help and to create an opportunity for, for youngins like we see over there to kind of have the same experience that we did. But today we thank him for his efforts on our behalf in securing funding for much needed, needed, much needed renovations to Sunny Cove Camp and, for, uh, and, and to note that this funding will allow us to begin the process of carrying out much needed renovations to Sunny Cove Camp with the goal of restoring it so that it is up to code and has the potential to reopen. Another project is the Mount Evergreen Ski Club in Kenora. Half a million dollars in NOHFC funding will help buy a new groomer and upgrade the facilities. And the city of Kenora is getting $450,000 for its waterfront to restore the James McMillan tugboat and build an accessible wooden ramp. LCBO workers held protests in 11 cities across the province on Monday, including in Thunder Bay. OPSU members gathered outside MPP Kevin Holland's office to protest Doug Ford's recent announcement to allow convenience stores to sell beer and wine by 2026. And the union is also worried that the next step could be selling off the LCBO. Jaden Billick has more. OPSU has gathered just about 7,000 signatures from LCBO employees across the province. Opposing the Ford government's announcement in December to allow up to 8,500 convenience and grocery stores to sell beer, wine, and cider. They're worried about the impact of privatization on public, unionized workers. This day of action also demands a halt to any potential plans to sell off the LCBO. The protest comes just one day before the union starts a new round of bargaining with the province. We're representing across 11 locations, uh, all at the same time at uh, MPP offices, conservative MPP offices across the province. Uh, we're here to tell Doug Ford that the LCBO is not for sale. Um, I appreciate the support of everyone behind me. I appreciate the support of everyone at OPSU, and I appreciate the support of the people of Ontario. The LCBO provides a $2.5 billion annual dividend to the province, which helps pay for health care and education. MPP Lise Faujois joined the protesters outside Holland's office as she worries that allowing the sale of spirits in stores other than the LCBO would be a detriment to public services. To remove $2.5 billion from the public purse is wrong, I think. There, there's no excuse for it except for this philosophy of privatizing everything. 
and to take away good union jobs uh, from a system that actually works quite well makes no sense either. We spoke with Holland after the protest and he rejected the allegations that the $2.5 billion could vanish from the public purse. That's not any the information that I'm receiving. We, we're retaining uh, the LCBO as a public co corporation so that we can maintain that revenue coming from the LCBO to support programs like education, healthcare, infrastructure, and that's going to be maintained. The expansion of new retail outlets are still going to be under the, the control of the LCBO. Jaden Billick, DBT News. We'll now head into another short break, and when we get back, we'll hear, we'll hear stories from two big lottery winners from our region. An Aquina couple has won big on an Ontario 49 ticket. Danielle Ferrero and Stephanie Ricard took home the $2 million top prize in the February 3rd draw. The couple say they were enjoying their morning coffee when they discovered that they had a pair of winning tickets, the first for $500 and then the big one that made them millionaires. They say it felt like a dream. The couple intends to invest most of the money but also, quote, consider some adventures as a way to celebrate. The $2 million ticket was purchased at Penex Tourist Service in Nikina. And there was another Northwestern Ontario resident who also won big with OLG. Nipigon's Linda Robbins took home $500,000 in the February 16th Lotto Max draw. The public sector retiree says she was about to check her ticket at the store and her husband told her to quote, holler for me when you win, as he wandered away and that's, what, and that's exactly what she did. Though she notes she could barely speak and her heart was racing. Robin says she'll treat her husband with a quote, new toy and share some with her grandchildren. The winning ticket was purchased at the bargain shop in Nipigon. The federal government has announced the rural and northern immigration pilot program will become permanent. The program is meant to bring more immigrants to the region to address labor shortages and strengthen the economy. In 2023, the region saw 475 successful applicants into the program. They've filled gaps in a variety of sectors, including the trades and health care. Thunder Bay Rainy River MP Marcus Pulowski says the permanent program will be crucial to the region's labor market for years to come. You talk to almost anybody in any business and they're having problems finding employees. Um, but not only businesses, and, and some businesses want to expand, but they can't because they can't find employees. 
But besides that, if you look at um, chronic care homes, they don't have enough PSWs. You look at the hospitals, they don't have enough nurses. As of the end of 2023, more than 4,500 newcomers have received permanent residency through the program. Dryden hockey stars Chris and Sean Pronger have taken another step in their off-ice career. The Pronger brothers have banded together to create their own whiskey brand called Journey. Glenn Campbell has the story. Chris Pronger and his brother Sean are used to signing autographs from their days in the NHL. On Monday, they were in Calgary signing bottles of Canadian whiskey. The brothers have started their own brand. It's called Journey, and it's a whiskey they both had a lot of input in making. Well, a long-time whiskey drinker, a uh, fan of the product, and, you know, I think we've done a lot of research and development on it. <laughs> but, uh, you know, Sean and I have been talking and uh, presented the opportunity with our partner, Niagara Falls Craft Distillery, in uh, creating our own and, and uh, authentic Canadian brand. During their days in the NHL, the Prongers never played on the same team. That's what makes this journey so special. They're doing it together. I can keep up with Chris on this, uh, on this uh, rink. Uh, so it's been fun. I mean, it's been fun. We talk, you know, minimum three or four times a week, uh, you know, sometimes every day. And uh, it's just kind of fun to be, like, have a, you know, a business that we're, we're both working on. And Journey is getting rave reviews. It's an award-winning whiskey. Made us feel really good about... What we, how, what we think the consumer's gonna like, uh, and obviously the branding too, uh, award-winning branding and, and liquid. So uh, we're excited about uh, the opportunity that, that this will uh, provide us. And uh, as I said, getting more people to try it and, and uh, make it their preferred whiskey. And fans seem to enjoy the product. Very good, like I said, I'm normally a crown guy, but uh, this might be better. I, they might have switched me over, so yeah, it's good. I mean, I just turned the legal age a couple months ago, so I haven't tried and indulged in too many alcoholic beverages, but that whiskey was pretty smooth, pretty good, so I thoroughly enjoyed it. And if you're wondering why it's called Journey, Sean explains it best. I would say the tagline kind of sums it up, right? Celebrate your victories, be proud of your scars, and enjoy the journey. That's all for this edition of Northwest Newsweek. Join us next time for more of the top stories from across the region.